Hello, viewers, and welcome to another episode of Elections by Numbers. Today, we're talking about the last frontier, Alaska. Alaska is the largest state in terms of land area, the least densely populated state, and the highest state, with Mount Denali reaching uh, heights of over 20,000 feet above sea level. In fact, Alaska contains 17 of the 20 tallest peaks in the country. Alaska is obviously also the northernmost state in the country, but it might also interest you to learn that it is the westernmost state and the easternmost state as well. So how can it possibly be both the westernmost and easternmost state? It is because of the Aleutian Islands, which uh, travel off of the uh, southwest coast of Alaska that way. And they do cross the uh, 180 degree line of longitude, therefore crossing the international date line and reaching into the Eastern hemisphere, uh, just below the uh, Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia. So technically those few islands are on the Eastern edge of the world map. Uh, making them part of the easternmost state, Alaska. For as massive as Alaska is, it does in fact only have one congressional house district, an at-large district covering the entire state, and it is currently represented by Republican Don Young. Don Young is actually the longest currently serving congressman in the country right now. He's been uh, representing Alaska's at-large district since 1973, and he is running again this year for a 25th term. Challenging Young is a woman named Elise Gavin, who also ran against him in 2018 and came within seven percentage points of uh, unseating him, making that one of his closest elections uh, in recent memory. To see how Alaskans have been voting for representatives, let's pull up a line graph right now and get into that. Okay, and taking a look at this, this is in fact one of the strangest line graphs I've seen so far in the series. It's because Alaska, Alaska is a really odd place electorally. I should point out to you that Elise Galvin was technically running as an independent in 2018, as she is again this year. So that value in 2018, which is the highest point uh, on this graph for Democratic turnout was in fact not for a Democrat, technically it was for independent candidate Elise Galvin. And as you can see, it's also the closest uh, that any candidate came to unseating Don Young during the last decade. He won by much larger margins of victory in uh, 2010 and 2012, but that dipped down in the 2014 midterms and hasn't really recovered too much since then. He performed slightly better in 2016, but has fallen down um, to uh, pretty alarming levels in recent times. It is interesting to note uh, here uh, and in a future section of this video how uh, Alaskans are much more likely to vote for independent candidates than they are uh, Democratic candidates. It's because Alaska, I think, prides itself on being fairly independent uh, from the other states of this country, and that's reflected somewhat in the way they vote. But anyway, let's toss that graph aside. Um, I do think Don Young is going to win again this year. He's done it 24 times already. He has the incumbency factor working in his advantage. However, it will be very close. It will be very close. I think uh, we'll see Don Young winning his 25th term by less than five percentage points. He's certainly nearing the end of his career at some point soon. Um, and uh, we are seeing in Alaska that is um, uh, becoming much more competitive at the House level as evidenced by uh, the way this data has been trending. So anyway, let's make that official. No change in Alaska's House. Uh, let's uh, put that on our first map right now. Mark it. Up next, we have a Senate election in Alaska. Incumbent Republican Dan Sullivan is running for his second term this year. He's being challenged by uh, independent candidate Al Gross, who is an orthopedic surgeon and a commercial fisherman. It should be noted that uh, Sullivan's first uh, senatorial victory occurred in 2014, during a year that was a, a midterm year, obviously, and a very good one for Republicans. But Sullivan only managed to carry Alaska's votes by roughly 2% margin of victory. So optimistic Democrats are uh, looking to Alaska's Senate seat this year as a possible pickup because it was so close with this candidate six years ago, but of course six years is a long time in politics. So we have to dig a little further to see how this could possibly go in November. To do that, let's take a look at some voter turnout ratios right now to see how Alaskans have been voting for senatorial candidates. And looking here, some very interesting numbers indeed uh, going back over the last decade. Let's first look at 2010 and 2016. Those were years where uh, Alaska's other senator, Lisa Murkowski, who is also a, a Republican, was running to uh, reclaim her seat. And she did enjoy a pretty noticeable advantages both of those years over her uh, either Democratic or independent candidate that she was facing. 2010 being a very, uh, very good year for her. Of course, that was just... Um, a couple years after Barack Obama won his first term as president. And then even again in 2016, when Donald Trump carried the state uh, and the Electoral College. But then when we look back to 2014, that was Dan Zul uh, Sullivan's first term. Uh, he was down by about 18 percentage points in terms of voter turnout ratio. That's the reason largely why he just barely squeaked by with 2% margin of victory. Remember, the gap has kind of been closing uh, in terms of uh, voters for 
uh, House candidates in Alaska over the last 10 years. So uh, differences like this of almost 20 percent uh, favoring a Democratic candidate can make or break uh, their run for Senate in the state. The House race would have had to have been just slightly more competitive than it was in 2014, and we would be looking at a possibly uh, Democratic senator running for re-election this year in Alaska. But as it turned out, uh, it's Dan Sullivan. Um, but but these are these voter ratios are largely why some people are kind of taking a closer look at Alaska this year. When you do look uh, deeper than the surface, you will see a more competitive state heading into the future, but we'll get into that in a later section. For now, let's toss uh, those numbers aside. Lastly, we do have to consider the approval rating of the incumbent. In this case, it is uh, Senator Sullivan. As of this video, he is at uh, plus 10 points in the state of Alaska, which is great news for him. It means um, uh, more Alas Alaskans have come around to uh, deeming him as a trustworthy senator. There's probably less skepticism uh, for him for uh, the job that he will do heading into this election than there was uh, prior to 2014. So now we have everything we need. We can give all of our variables to Pollbot to calculate uh, who's likely to win the Senate seat in Alaska this year. Pollbot. Okay, interesting. There's your result. It is Dan Sullivan projected to win a second term in Alaska, but by only a 6.81% margin of victory. This is by no means a safe seat uh, for Republicans at this point. It may have been uh, six, eight, ten years ago, but a margin of victory under 10%, um, 6.81 is, uh, that's, that's shaky ground, uh, and, uh, warning signs should be going off for Republicans in the state of Alaska heading into the future. Al Gross's, uh, independent status, uh, as opposed to a democratic status, uh, is likely to help his candidacy, uh, because, uh, Alaskans historically have voted for independent candidates higher than uh, at higher rates than Democratic candidates. So Sullivan also has that going against him. Um, we do have him projected to win, but I think it's gonna be closer than people expect, roughly something like this. So let's make uh, this result official and put it on our senatorial map right now. Mark it. Now it is time to talk about the presidential election of 2020 starring President Donald Trump and Democratic challenger Joe Biden. Alaska's first uh, presidential election occurred in 1960, the year after it became a state. And in all the years since then, it has only voted for a Democratic candidate for president once, and that was in 1964. More recently, uh, Democrats have rarely risen above uh, a 40% share of the vote in Alaska, whereas Republicans have rarely fallen below a 50% share of the vote. The state most recently elected uh, President Trump over Hillary Clinton by a, a, a pretty comfy 15% uh, margin of victory, with also a large uh, share of the vote going to third party candidates as well. To see how Alaskans have voted for presidential candidates recently, let's pull up uh, some more voter turnout ratios right now. And here we go, some interesting numbers indeed. Um, you know, what I take away from these is uh, I think Alaskans care more about the candidate than they do about the party they belong to. We saw Democrats' uh, turnout ratio just really much better than Republicans' turnout ratio uh, in 2012. Of course, that was when uh, Barack Obama won his second term against Mitt Romney. And then that major difference uh, reducing to almost nothing in 2016, just a less than 1% margin difference. Uh, between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump with it slightly favoring Trump. You know, of course, these are relative to House turnout numbers as well. And uh, if you'll remember, 2012 was a much more definitive victory for Don Young, the Republican, at the House level than 2016 was for him. So that's also at play here uh, in uh, these results where uh, the difference has reduced uh, from <laughs> 60 points to zero. Heading into this year, I would expect uh, Joe Biden's voter turnout ratio to be slightly higher than Hillary Clinton's was. And I do expect Donald Trump's to be roughly the same, to be perfectly honest. I mean, his approval in the state, which we'll get into uh, very soon, is um, has remained pretty roughly unchanged over the course of his presidency. In fact, it may have even uh, decreased slightly. Basically, I think Biden will do a little better than Hillary Clinton in Alaska, and I think Trump will do pretty much the same and much fewer third party uh, votes being cast in the state as well. Okay, now let's toss those numbers aside and uh, lastly consider the approval rating of the incumbent. In this case, it is President Trump. You might be surprised to learn that Trump's approval rating in the state is at minus seven points right now, which is not good for a Republican uh, incumbent president in a state like Alaska, which has not voted for a Democratic president in 56 years. So when you consider everything we know so far, a tightening uh, competitive race at the House level, coupled with uh, slightly better turnout ratios for Democrats on the whole, and a negative approval rating for Trump, this is actually gonna be, um, I think Alaska is gonna be a bit of a surprise to people this year um, to see exactly how surprising it could possibly be. Let's uh, give all our variables to Pollbot to calculate how this is going to go way up there in the north. Pull bot. 
And there you have it. Uh, Trump projected to win the state of Alaska, but by only 8.04%. This is a margin of victory that will uh, we projected to have degraded for Trump by roughly 50%. Remember, he enjoyed a 15% margin of victory uh, in 2016. Now he's going to be f falling below uh, 10%. Uh, we predict. This is due in large part to the trend, the upward increasing trend in turnout for Democratic candidates at the House level, coupled with the decreasing trend in turnout for Republicans at the House level, Trump's negative seven point approval rating, and the slight advantage in voter turnout ratios that are likely to favor Biden this year. I think the decreasing uh, share of votes going to third parties that uh, I imagine will be happening this year will favor Trump slightly more than it will favor Biden because Alaska doesn't elect Democrats. They elect independents. They elect Republicans. Not really Democrats, though. So I think that difference is going to really help his chances in re-election this year. But he still, I don't think, is going to crack 10% this year. That's going to be the big surprise. Now, let's make this result official and put it on our presidential map right now. Mark it. So all the election results are in for the state of Alaska. We're seeing a state that is becoming uh, more competitive, slightly, although still projecting uh, Republicans to carry the state uh, this year. Let's now uh, talk briefly about the future of the state by pulling up an old line graph and two new ones. First, let's take a look, uh, a bit of a closer look at the raw house turnout numbers in the state of Alaska. Um, of course, remember, there's only one district. So this is all these uh, Republican votes are for Don Young um, and all the uh, Blue votes are for either his Democratic or independent challengers. Let's take a look specifically at those slope values that we see in both of those equations. For Don Young, the Republican, it's that value preceding X, that negative eight. And for Democrats, it's that value of 13.4. Basically what that means is on average, when you look at the last decade as a whole, every two years, Don Young has been losing votes at a rate of 8,000 every two years. You couple that with uh, Democrats and independents, increasing their turnout numbers every two years by 13,400 votes, we see uh, a state that's tightening up by a rate of roughly 20,000 votes every two years going back to 2010, ultimately ending in a projected election uh, at the House level in Alaska for 2020 that is much more competitive than it has been for a very long time. Although, of course, we've projected Don Young to carry the state again, but by less than five percentage points. Um, this is bad news for Republicans in the state. I mean, these are almost like mirror images of each other. They're bouncing from one side to the other. Um, and uh, that's um, certainly not good for a Republican prospects uh, moving forward. And next, let's take a look at these, uh, these other two line graphs. These are estimates for the rate of increase or decrease in those voter turnout ratios that I was using uh, for the uh, senatorial and presidential elections. We see downward trending lines for both parties at the senatorial level, curiously. What that's basically telling me is that uh, Alaskans are, are less enthusiastic to vote for senatorial candidates uh, today than they were 10 years ago. The downward trend is uh, slightly worse for Republicans at this point because of Dan Sullivan's uh, pretty close election, uh, pretty close shave in 2014. If Don Young continues to lose voters at the rate that he is, and this downward trend continues for uh, Republican senatorial candidates in the state, I would expect to see much more competitive senatorial races in the state of Alaska, um, especially if uh, the candidate on the Democratic ticket is uh, officially independent. And next, when we look at the uh, estimates for the rate of increase or decrease for presidential candidates, voter ratios in Alaska, we see a downward trending, a more noticeable downward trending uh, slope value for Democrats. That's probably, I mean, that's basically because Obama was a much more popular candidate overall than Hillary Clinton was, both in the country as a whole and in the state of Alaska. And moving forward, I would expect Democrats, uh, Democratic presidential candidates in the state of Alaska uh, to bounce back uh, from this uh, decrease and we might even see a much more competitive Alaska at the presidential level heading into the future. All right, let's toss those graphs aside. I'll give you my final consensus on Alaska. It is becoming pretty obviously a less reliable Republican state, although not necessarily a more uh, Democrat state. The most competitive races that we've observed in Alaska over the last 10 years occur when Republicans are running against independent candidates, which is why the Alaskan Democratic Party is uh, smartly putting up more independent candidates to run in the House and the Senate race this year. As I've already mentioned, I think uh, Alaska seems to pride itself on its independent status up there on its own. Um, and I think uh, independent candidates fare better 
in the state just as a rule than Democrats do. They've certainly proven themselves to be better contenders uh, at the state level. At the end of the day, I, I would expect that Alaska is no longer going to be a completely reliably safe Republican stronghold moving forward. And if I were a member of the Alaskan Republican Party, I would be sounding the alarm today. That just about does it for our latest episode of Elections by Numbers. I want to thank you, the viewer, for tuning in today. If you like what you saw, please hit the subscribe button to get updates on new content as it becomes available. I upload videos every Monday and Thursday. I'm also on Twitter and update that account with which state I'm covering next ahead of the scheduled release date. So if you want to stay ahead of the curve, please give me a follow on Twitter and that link is in the description. Thanks again for watching. Thank you for voting and I'll see you next time.